So I don't have to um, get somebody else to um, make up what I was proposing to say, um, since, as some of you may know from previous um, uh, occasions when I've had the honour of delivering this lecture, uh, I tend to speak um, uh, from uh, notes or, worst of all, as the uh, head of the uh, China New China News Agency in Hong Kong used to say, to speak from the heart, which was obviously regarded uh, as very bad form. Um, uh, but it is a great pleasure to be asked to deliver this lecture uh, once again, um, albeit to do so virtually. Um, it denies me the pleasure of another visit to Luxembourg. I first visited Luxembourg as a small boy because my dad, who had been a, a professional musician, uh, was by that stage a music publisher. And we went on holiday while he um, pressed his case with various producers of shows on Radio Luxembourg. Uh, I came back with them um, almost as much enjoyment many times when I was both a minister and above all when I was a European uh, commissioner uh, and uh, very much enjoyed uh, all those visits. And I had a number of, uh, of uh, distinguished Luxembourg diplomats working for me when I was a commissioner, not least in my, in my cabinet. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be doing this lecture again disappointed that it has to be done virtually, uh, but hope that um, a Time's Wing Chariot um, will bear me once again to, um, to uh, uh, Luxembourg in the future. In the meantime, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Louise um, for helping to organize this. Um, all those who sponsored it, I'd particularly like to thank the uh, British Luxembourg Society, the University of Luxembourg, uh, the ambassador whom uh, I'm sure will greatly enjoy uh, time in, in Luxembourg as ambassador. Uh, and finally, I'd like just to say what a pleasure it is to welcome anyone uh, listening from, the, from Oxford University and to say that yesterday evening, uh, I spent some time in Oxford with my wife um, at an opening or at the show of an extraordinary piece of glass sculpture produced by an artist called Angela Palmer um, in recognition of the work done by some of our greatest scientists uh, in uh, producing a vaccine against the coronavirus. And I spoke then to Professor Gilbert, Professor Pollard, uh, and others who made this extraordinary and successful um, uh, venture, um, which I think has so far um, seen one, almost one and a half um, billion uh, vaccines uh, in people's arms uh, all around the world. So it's, it's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to report to all of you uh, who were at Oxford that the university is in, is in terrific shape, uh, despite the fact that it waits with um, some trepidation at uh, news of what the government will do about uh, the research funding for universities, uh, which uh, much of which has been lost because of our departure from the European Union, something which many of us um, deplored and thought was going to be extremely self-damaging, uh, a point of view which I suspect Sir Winston might have felt uh, himself. Now, um, I said uh, uh, that I would uh, speak about China and the global balance uh, this evening. And the fact that I do so um, under um, uh, the title of the Winston Churchill lecture uh, doesn't mean I hope um, that I'll be accused of proposing establishing a bamboo wall uh, around China. Um, it, China is customary these days described in, uh, in communiques as um, a systemic competitor. I'm not sure that I know what that means. Um, I think it's a, it's a way of calling a country a potential threat without actually using the word threat. Um, but um, I, I'm certainly not going to propose that we should uh, launch a cold war uh, against, uh, against China, far from it, as you will hear, but I'm not uh, going to make the sort of speech which would get um, uh, me big applause from United Front newspapers 
uh, in in Beijing or uh, elsewhere. Um, uh, one of the things uh, which I do think is relevant um, in relation to the Cold War is the long telegram which the American diplomat George Kennan produced in, I think, 1946, which, as you know, laid out what became uh, the Western strategy for the next 40 years or so on the Soviet Union. And, and Kennan talked in that um, uh, uh, telegram, and I think it's a remarkably prescient uh, sentence. He said that um, the Soviet Union's view of reality was simply incompatible that was the word he used, incompatible with the view of open liberal democracies. And I think it's, it's a sentence which is relevant to our relationship today with, uh, with China. But let me explain um, exactly what I mean by that. Just let me set the background, first of all. Uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, um, up to about 1820, according to the great economic historian Angus Madison, um, the Qing dynasty, Qing China, um, was responsible for about 30-31% of global GDP. Uh, and if you looked at the uh, figure for both India and China, it was about 51% of uh, global GDP. So just over 30% for China and just over, uh, 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 and the rest um, uh, from India. During the course of, of the century, of course, with an enfeebled um, Qing dynasty trying to hold on to power. Uh, China was treated by the Western imperial powers and by Japan as a sort of hulk out of which they could take chunks. Uh, and we did that ourselves, trying to uh, globalize uh, China through the sale of opium uh, and uh, fighting a war uh, about the sale of opium, which led in the 1840s and 20 years later to our seizure of a chunk uh, of China, um, uh, just south of the Tropic of Cancer, near the Pearl River, um, uh, the peninsula of Kowloon, the associated islands, uh, and uh, what was called the Fragrant Harbor, Hong Kong. Uh, and we added to that um, bit of plunder uh, at the end of the, the tail end of the century in 1898. Uh, though on this occasion, um, after terrible things like the burning of the Summer Palace in Beijing, uh, after um, uh, the 1898, uh, we only accepted um, or we took uh, what are called the new territories, the hinterland of what we'd already seized um, as an, on a lease, a 99 year lease. Uh, and nobody I think at the time would have anticipated that 99 years was, was, ever going to be, was ever going to be over. It has to be said that when we made our original seizure of that uh, part of South China, Lord Palmerston, who was then foreign secretary, and his colleagues thought it was a miserable um, uh, bit of plunder. Uh, and the, the man responsible for negotiating it, who was the head of, the, of uh, British trade interests in Southern China, Captain Charles Elliott, got as his next diplomatic appointment um, at the job as charge d'affaires in the new Republic of Texas. Uh, he, his career was crowned, which is perhaps an in, a indication uh, that he wasn't well thought of um, for what he'd achieved in, uh, in the uh, I I imperial snatch and grab um, exercise uh, in the early 19th century. His last appointment was as governor of St. Helena, which I don't imagine was a, a very cheerful post, not least since it takes so long to get there and indeed to uh, get away that one might like to get away rather more rapidly. The, um, the end of the Qing era uh, and the beginning of the last century uh, saw an extraordinary kaleidoscope of political and economic events in China. Uh, there was, first of all, the uh, uh, attempts at democracy uh, under the guidance of Sun Yat-sen, who, who, uh, uh, who had been uh, spent a part of his education and formative years uh, in Hong Kong. That was followed by the conflicts between uh, a succession of, of warlords, followed again by uh, a, an invasion by Japan, uh, and then by the civil war between the nationalist Kuomintang and the communists 
who, even though the uh, the Comintern, even though the uh, the uh, Communist International had wanted uh, the Chinese Communist Party to be based on on urban um, working class activists, it turned into a peasant movement, and it was a peasant movement uh, which uh, brought Mao to power in 1949. Helped, I think it's fair to say, both by the uh, active support um, of the uh, of the uh, Soviet Union, helped um, in some of his darkest period uh, by the sale of opium, uh, and also helped in a way by the acquiescence of the United States in Mao's um, in Mao's communist nationalist takeover. So China was branded with Mao. Um, and uh, uh, who, who was the who was of course the subject of a huge personality cult, uh, and we then saw the years of of Mao, which I think would qualify him to be in in the in the Premiership League when it came to um, to uh, to nineteenth century twentieth century uh, dictators. We had the the Great Famine uh, with with its. Um, uh, with its uh, huge number of deaths, its tombstone politics, even cannibalism. We had the Great Leap Forward and we had the Cultural Revolution. And it's worth um, bearing in mind that the population of Hong Kong is largely made up of refugees from the rather grim, uh, brutal politics of, of communist uh, China, which is something which I think um, the Chinese are uh, rather reluctant to understand or accept. China, China's economy continued to flatline under Mao. Uh, but what, um, what actually uh, set China off in an explosive, in an explosive growth, rather like the, what had happened already with uh, Asian countries, uh, which uh, fizzed and rocketed uh, out of the um, ashes of uh, nuclear and conventional war in the uh, in the late 40s and 50s. What actually set uh, China off uh, was um, Mao's death, the rehabilitation and leadership of Deng Xiaoping, uh, and uh, uh, his determination to ensure that China rejoined the global economy. Uh, China uh, was open. China managed to succeed in, in opening the rest of the world uh, economies to its own exports and to some extent opened itself up to investment from the rest of, of the world. And the, the consequences were an extraordinary surge of growth, perhaps not extraordinary if you look at what had already happened in Japan, in South Korea, in uh, Hong Kong, in Singapore uh, and the tiger economies of Asia. But we saw year after year of dramatically fast growth, sometimes as, as uh, high as 10% uh, in annual terms. We saw uh, China becoming um, arguably the largest economy in the world, or um, certainly the second largest, but you can make, make a claim that it's already the largest, though it does tend to depend on Chinese economic statistics, which are um, not terribly reliable, as the Chinese premier himself uh, once said, why he said to an interviewer, do you believe these figures? I don't. Um, secondly, uh, the Chinese have become the largest, um, uh, uh, not only the largest economy in the world, but the largest consumer of energy, the largest exporter of merchandise. Um, they've become uh, the holder of the largest number of, of foreign reserves, uh, and the, certainly the largest holder of, of US debt. Um, the World Bank has calculated uh, that in a period of 30 years, about 750 million uh, people in China, peasants, uh, families in China, um, rose above the international poverty line. And that's been done without um, eliminating the huge gap between the well-off and the less well-off. It's arguably the case that the degree of social inequity in China is greater than in the United States. If you compare the uh, uh, earnings and wealth of the top 20% with the bottom 20%, the multiple um, in China 
is uh, over 10, the multiple in America is, is about eight. So it, it's not the sort of communism um, which um, one would normally uh, expect to see. It's more like, of course, Leninism. At the same time as you've seen a huge and welcome uh, increase in the number of the very poor who've been lifted out of the worst sort of poverty, um, you've also seen the development of a middle class, which probably these days um, uh, amounts to about 700 million, which is why car manufacturers uh, like Volkswagen, which plays such a prominent part in determining German foreign policy, uh, the, the manufacturers of, of uh, luxury goods are so keen on, on getting uh, into the Chinese market and to selling uh, to its growing middle class. Um, it's also worth saying that the Chinese have invested hugely in infrastructure, in roads, in railways, in, in airports, invested hugely in energy, uh, particularly uh, the manufacturer. I think they, they, they open one a week of coal-fired power stations and um, uh, in other uh, more, more advanced um, uh, technological industries. Um, they are a very a preeminent player in some areas of, of high technology. And, uh, but it's worth recalling that they're also hugely dependent uh, on imports of semiconductors. They spend about, mostly from incidentally Taiwanese companies, they spend about $350 billion um, a year uh, on uh, importing chips, which is about 150 million billion more than they spend on the importation of, of oil. So um, they are uh, uh, an important player on the international scene, but they're not perhaps quite as dominant. It's a point I, I'll come back to a little later as people sometimes suppose. Now, as the Chinese uh, have taken advantage of the opening of markets, and that was of course given a particular spurt when they when they joined the WTO and I was part of the team which helped uh, them negotiate that on on behalf of the w uh, on behalf of the European Union uh, even before that they'd increased their exports to the United States by 1600 percent in a period of 15 years you wanted to know how well China was doing you only had to look at the shelves of any Walmart Having joined the um, WTO, um, uh, their trade surplus with um, the United States uh, simply soared, going up from uh, 83 billion in 2001 to 400 billion in 2018 after uh, two years of President Trump trying to drive it down. Um, and it's worth saying that of course, while um, uh, there were exports from other countries um, into China, into China's growing market, and some countries did very well, particularly perhaps Germany. Um, the, the, there wasn't any reciprocity about it. And on the whole, China did better in, in every balance. For example, with the United Kingdom, um, according to the um, IMF trade flow statistics, uh, the United Kingdom's exports to China went up in real terms by 3.7% from 1980 to 2019. China's exports to Britain went up by over 9% in that period. So um, it's, not, not, um, uh, it's not sensible, I think, to regard China as uh, doing us um, a huge number of favors um, if, uh, if only we um, mind our P's and Q's politically uh, with, uh, with China. Um, China also, of course, invests a good deal in other countries. Again, not out of an act of charity. It's not a branch of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, uh, but because um, it invariably it wants to um, either make money or to stake a claim in an important part of uh, another country's economy, their infrastructure or their uh, energy or their uh, telecommunications. So we should welcome um, uh, China's. Uh, rejuvenation. Um, it's good for Chinese people. It should be good for the rest of the world. But I don't think we should be bowled over um, by the thought that uh, if only we get on with China, we can somehow 
um, completely transform our own e economies and economic achievements. One thing which has been delusional in our attitude to China, in my view, is the assumption um, which many have made, and, and to some extent, I've, I've, I think made, I used to make this mistake myself, the assumption that there was a sort of mar mar Marxist predictability about um, what would happen. Marx, as you would call, used to argue that um, uh, uh, politics invariably followed economics. So people would argue that if, if China was opening up its economy, sooner or later it would open up um, its, its politics. And even after Tiananmen and all those um, bodies, particularly of students in and around Tiananmen Square, even after that, um, President Bush, the first President Bush and others thought that sooner or later, that China would start to open up politically. And there was a bit of that happening under, under Jiang Shimin um, uh, for a few years um, at the beginning of the century. Um, but we then had the huge change with the arrival of Xi Jinping um, about um, eight years ago uh, as the top dog in China. Uh, and I think several things combined at one and the same time. First of all, I think the Chinese leadership was spooked by what looked like an attempt by a very charismatic former com commerce uh, minister who was um, uh, uh, the mayor of Chongqing, which is to, to China's development, a bit like Chicago uh, in uh, America in the, 19th, in the 19th century. Bo Xilai, tried to elbow his way into the top leadership of the Communist Party uh, and to grab power. And I think that that greatly disturbed uh, the, the leadership at the time and made them extremely cautious. Um, secondly, it may seem a rather foolish thing to say, but it's undoubtedly the case that the main uh, intellectual advisor uh, to, uh, uh, to Xi Jinping, uh, a man called Wang Qishan, was um, obsessed with Alexis de Tocqueville, not with de Tocqueville's book on America, but with a, with a book which um, I had to read when I was doing prelims at, uh, at Oxford reading history, um, The Ancien Regime uh, and the French Revolution. And there were two aspects of that, which apparently um, uh, Wang Qishan and others thought were warnings for China, first of all, the argument in de Tocqueville's great book, and I think he is one of the most important political philosophers uh, for philosophers of all time. Um, de Tocqueville argued that just because people are getting better off doesn't mean that they're going to be easier to govern because it was happening in the 18th century. People were getting better off, but it didn't make them uh, e e easier to govern. The other thing which de Tocqueville argues, which de Tocqueville argues in that extraordinary book is that any authoritarian regime is always at its most vulnerable when it tries to reform. Uh, and I think those lessons were taken to heart by Wang Qishan. And there was a period when sales of the Ancien Regime, doubtless a Chinese edition and doubtless pirated, spiked uh, in China. When I went to speak once at the, at the party school in Beijing um, and mentioned it, everybody knew what I was talking about. Um, the other thing which I think happened uh, and made the Chinese leadership extremely nervous was a realization that globalization with what it was doing to employment patterns, that urbanization with the flood of people from the countryside, poor and not very well educated people from the countryside into the cities, uh, and um, uh, changes in the in internet were making it increasingly difficult for the Chinese Communist Party to keep a grip on power. Uh, and the consequence was that um, under Xi Jinping, they have tightened their grip um, and uh, uh, assaulted uh, any aspect uh, of what one might call the, the loosening of, uh, Chinese, of Chinese communist governance, from uh, civil society to, to dissidents of any sort, um, to critics, to uh, uh, human rights lawyers, uh, and, and so on. And the Ch Chinese leadership under Xi Jinping went even further. One of the most revealing documents which explains what's going on 
is a document called um, rather uh, boringly, prosaically, pedantically, communique number nine. Um, uh, communique number nine um, warned the uh, of officials um, in the party and the government that they should be prepared for an intense struggle, those were the words used, against all the aspects of Western liberal democracy, which threatened existentially um, the Chinese Communist Party's grip on power. What did they mean? They meant the notion that um, human rights were universally valid and applicable. They meant um, Western ideas of journalism. They meant, of course, Western democracy. Um, they meant, of course, what they called historical nihilism, which means uh, the sort of historical inquiry uh, which would tell people or remind people what had actually happened in Tiananmen Square. And that was regarded um, as a real threat, a real enemy, the most important enemy that China faced, liberal democracy. Uh, and the argument had to be carried into every school and every university uh, because uh, the leadership of the Communist Party agreed with Stalin's description of education as an engineer of the soul. So uh, since uh, Xi Jinping, I think that you've seen not only a tightening of uh, the Communist Party's grip um, at the center, the end of any hope that opening the economy and technological change was going to produce an early political uh, uh, liberalization. And you've also seen China prepared to throw its weight around rather more in the world with what's called a wolf warrior diplomacy. Partly, I think, because it, China has felt that it could do so, and partly because it thought he could do so because I think the leadership is profoundly convinced of the fact that the West liberal democracy is um, to some extent in decline uh, and that um, the Chinese communism uh, and Asia are in the descendant, in the ascendant. And they particularly, I think, um, though I'm not sure what they're feeling about it now, um, took the view that um, America was uh, in decline, not something which um, I think myself, though I have some doubts, which I'll come back to perhaps a little later or in questions. Now, there are a number of things which I think we have to take account of in dealing with China. First of all, um, they have a narrative which assumes that there is something called a, a good relationship with China. Jeffrey Howe, who I think slightly fell for this, who I, a man of I much admired, used to think of, of the relationship with China, he used to think it was about Hong Kong, partly as well, was like a, a Ming vase, which you had to carry carefully um, from one part of the room to another. Um, now, most people don't think of a, of a relationship with another company, country like that. You think of a relationship, by and large, as a succession um, of different issues where you take account of one another's interests and try to come to a harmonious and balanced view. But for the Chinese, if you don't accept their own narrative um, about uh, the relationship, uh, then you're um, a, a dead duck. Secondly, I think that um, uh, the Chinese have also, the Chinese Communist Party also argues that um, uh, to criticize China is to criticize, um, to criticize, uh, sorry, the Communist Party is to criticize China and to criticize Chinese people. And that's based on a sort of Leninist piece of theology, of, of consubstantiality. Um, if you love China, um, you uh, love the Communist Party, or if you love the Communist Party, you love China. Um, and it, it's, it's quite a difficult thing for anybody in Taiwan or anybody over which, incidentally, China has never had so a sovereignty, or, or anybody in, in Hong Kong, given that the majority are themselves the family of refugees from events created by Chinese communism. Um, that definition of patriotism, that definition of there being no distinction between, between the Communist Party and China is, is certainly not one which I would accept myself. I have huge admiration, for example, for those very brave doctors and nurses and medical staff in Wuhan um, at the beginning of the uh, pandemic who tried to blow the whistle um, on what was happening and tried to tell the rest of China and the world um, what was happening and was shut up by the security forces, 
most famously, Dr. Li Wenliang, um, uh, who was, I think, a dentist, um, uh, was uh, died um, of the coronavirus, having tried to, as I say, blow the whistle on what was happening. Now, when the um, uh, when the Australians tried to um, uh, ensure that there was a proper and full and open inquiry um, by the WHO, chance would be a fine thing, um, into the origins of the coronavirus. Um, and they did so because they'd been given assurances by the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi um, back in the end of January um, last year that the, this uh, disease which had been which they'd heard about was curable and preventable while the Chinese were busy buying up uh, medical supplies from Australia as they were from the United Kingdom. So the Australians had not unreasonably taken the view that they should actually know how the thing had started. Um, they were immediately greeted by, the, by pretty, pretty blunt coercive activity, um, which is still going on today. And I mention all that in some detail not in order to explore at this stage where coronavirus did actually come from um, and hope that um, sooner or later um, people will be able to, to, to decide for themselves on the basis of, of the evidence whether uh, it was just the result of, of bats um, in, the, in a wet market, of which there are of course many in, in Wuhan, or whether it was a result of a leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology um, which is a plausible argument and shouldn't simply be disbelieved because um, President Trump believed in it. I mean, there are a huge number of scientists, including some who wrote to uh, Science magazine that did this um, a, a few days ago, who, who would take that view. But I make all that because it, it was a reminder of the fact that the Chinese Communist Party can't be trusted. And um, after the SARS outbreak in uh, at the beginning of, of the century, there were there was a negotiation of things called the International Health Regulations, um, which the Chinese were persuaded to sign up to, not least because everybody knew that SARS had started in China. And the SARS, in, the, the International Health Regulations, obliged countries to report in a timely way, within 24 hours, um, on um, any uh, epidemic, any public health emergency. And of course, that's not what happened with the coronavirus and every day lost uh, in, uh, I, in uh, alerting the world to what was happening uh, must have been responsible for the growth um, in a much bigger way than happened with SARS and for deaths and death and chaos. So the, it's an important point to make that the Chinese can't actually be trusted. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party, sorry, let, can't actually be trusted. So when people talk about the Chinese Communist Party, about Beijing being a, an important stakeholder in the international community, you have to realize when you say that, that wherever you look, they've broken their word. They've, they've broken their word uh, within the WTO, um, both the letter and the spirit of what they signed up to then. They continue to discriminate against uh, multinational companies. They continue to su subsidize uh, their own companies against international competition. They continue to be responsible for um, pressured joint ventures and for uh, intellectual property theft. We also know that they've broken their world word over Hong Kong in a major way. Uh, Hong Kong, which is now being placed in, in handcuffs. Um, the, uh, the joint declaration negotiated in the 1980s, um, which came into a force in 1997 when we left, was supposed to guarantee Hong Kong's autonomy and way of life for 50 years after 1997. Well, it's certainly not 15 years uh, after 1997. We've also seen um, them break their word over the militarization of, of atolls and islands in the South China Sea, absolutely against what Xi Jinping um, promised to um, President uh, Obama. So uh, it's very difficult to take them seriously um, as a, an international stakeholder when they plainly don't actually um, play by the same rules as the rest of us. I talked about the unequal treaties of the 19th century, 
I suppose you could actually talk about the unequal treaties um, uh, uh, of the late 20th and the beginning of the 21st centuries. Um, they engage in coercive uh, action against people, against countries which displease them, Canada, Australia, South Korea, Norway, um, uh, uh, anyone uh, else. Uh, and um, uh, uh, they have, as I said earlier, um, launched a, a values um, attack through the United Front uh, on the basis of Western, uh, not just Western, but liberal democracies um, around the world. Now, uh, saying all that, uh, I do think we're dealing at the moment with what um, a, a very considerable former diplomat, um, I think I use the word um, sort of rather loosely, um, uh, and China expert Charles Parton. I think we're dealing with peak China. I think China is um, at its strongest in, in relation to the rest of the world. And I don't think that it's, uh, it's plausible to think of China as becoming the world's greatest superpower. And there are several reasons for that. First of all, demography, the Chinese population is starting to fall. Um, uh, there is a terrible gender imbalance, which means that there'll be 40 or 50 million young men who will never have a chance of, of, uh, uh, of marrying. Um, the, the birth rate has fallen well below replacement levels. People like the Gates Foundation think that the, or suggested that the, found, that the population of China will have fallen to um, uh, about half what it is today uh, by the end of the century. Um, and that is because um, the, uh, of the low fertility rate, uh, which is seeing um, a larger number of people in retirement being supported by a falling um, uh, economically active part of the population. Um, in the meantime, um, India is seeing an increase um, in its economically active population. So demography is a big problem. Debt is a big problem with indebtedness and the misallocation of resources, but indebtedness uh, equaling about 300 plus um, percent of of, um, uh, of GDP. Uh, the environment, people talk about uh, as all having a stake in dealing with climate change. Well, nobody has a bigger state, stake than China uh, because of um, largely drought, which particularly affects the north of the, of the country. One figure that um, sticks in my mind is that um, in the last 20 years, 28,000 rivers have simply disappeared uh, in, in China. So there are big environmental problems and there are problems um, of rural poverty and education. Only 30% of the population, of the working population, have um, finished secondary education. And it's quite difficult to imagine how you can break out of what's called the middle income trap, um, which has affected South Africa, Brazil and others um, against that background. So I don't believe that uh, that China is remorselessly heading um, to be the world's greatest superpower. Now, China has been lucky for the last four years, um, fortunate to have President Trump, who even while he identified some of the unfairnesses in Chinese trade practice, nevertheless um, pursued that, um, while at the same time uh, denying the importance of having uh, any allies or working with other people. And what, what is a bit dangerous for China, I guess, is that President Biden takes um, a very different approach. Um, he wants to work with other liberal democracies to defend and protect what we stand for, um, though sometimes we undermine that ourselves. Um, he believes, as I do, that we should work with China where it's in the global interest to do so, um, over things like climate change and over um, dealing with antimicrobial resistance, which is the next big health problem coming around the corner at us particularly a big problem because of the, in China, because of the incontinent use of antibiotics. So he believes um, that we should work with China when China plays by the rules and when there's a global interest in do doing so. But when China doesn't play by the rules, when China breaks the rules, uh, we should ensure uh, that it's made to face uh, some consequences of that. He also believes, as I do, that we should work together with other liberal democracies to restore the moral purpose of 
UN agencies, which after all, in many respects were created by American leadership, um, but which in the last few years have been abandoned, largely abandoned by, by Washington. And he also thinks, uh, I hope, um, I, I, th I think I'm right in saying he thinks that um, we, should be, we should band together in open societies, liberal democracies, in order to invest in the sort of areas of high technology uh, where we think we might be outpaced um, by China, for example, in uh, AI and robotics and, and, uh, and uh, telecommunications. So um, there, is a, there is an agenda there which isn't about um, uh, a Cold War. It's not about building, uh, a, as I said, an, an, a bamboo curtain around China. What it is about uh, is, um, I think, realistically, um, uh, re recognizing that we don't want to contain China, but we should, in the phrase of, of the late and very considerable um, international scholar, Gerald Siegel, we should want to constrain China, constrain China when it behaves badly as it has over, over um, Hong Kong, constrain China when it behaves badly as it has in trying to coerce other countries, constrain China when it's um, uh, engage in the sale of, of, um, of, uh, of body parts, constrain China um, when it's um, uh, involved in forced labor, partly uh, using people who in, in effect are uh, locked up in concentration camps in Xinjiang, where there is where the British and Dutch um, and Canadian parliaments have all have all um, suggested that the Chinese Communist Party is guilty of genocide under the UN Convention. I'm not, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I can't uh, make that determination myself, but I certainly think that what's happened in Xinjiang is a crime against humanity. Um, I just want to make one final point before welcoming any questions. Um, a, a friend of mine says, um, which is a rather um, uh, attractive way of putting it, that what we want is a sort of Goldilocks China. Uh, we don't want China to be too hot um, because it will try to bully the rest of us, but we don't want China to be too cold um, because um, for China to do badly, for China to implode or for the Chinese economy to flatline would be bad for the rest of us. What we want is, a, is China somewhere, somewhere in the middle. And I think that we also want as open societies and liberal democracies to stand up for ourselves in dealing with China, because if we don't, um, then I think the consequences would be, would be pretty bad for our own domestic politics and our own domestic economics. So um, uh, let me end there and welcome any questions.